Welcome to the Frog Logic Podcast. I'm your host, David Rutt Rutherford, back here again uh, with another incredible episode. Uh, I hope you guys liked the last one, the battle for potential, man. Uh, it was such a, a phenomenal, uh, inspiring uh, episode of, of a Jordan Peterson podcast that this thing just seeded in my soul. And I just wanted to really help y'all begin to recognize that your potential is in your own hands, man. What happens to you in your future uh, is all directly reflective of how you imagine uh, the reality of your existence, man, and what you're going to do about it. And I want to tell you the guy that is coming on, man, my friend, my dear friend uh, who's coming on today is probably one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met in my life. I have such deep, profound respect for Eddie Gallagher that uh, you will definitely hear it, not only in this interview, but I also feel like I need to tell you because that's who I am. All right, so why do I have this profound respect for Eddie Gallagher and his potential and the, the things he's done in his life? Well, I will tell you that Eddie joined the Navy at 19. He ended up doing uh, almost 20 years uh, 15 of those years in the SEAL teams. He was in the Marine Corps as a, as a Navy medic, a corpsman before that, and that's that's awesome detail. Had a combat deployment there. Uh, Eddie deployed eight times into war zones uh, while he was a Navy SEAL and one with the Marine Corps. Uh, um, in, in 2014, Eddie Gallagher, Chief Gallagher by then, was named Sailor of the Quarter and then Sailor of the Year by the Naval Special Warfare Group 1, which is all West Coast Base SEALs. And during his career, Eddie was awarded two Bronze Stars with Valor, Meritorious Unit Commendations, Presidential Unit Citations, two Navy, Navy Commendation Medals, three Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medals, and one with V for Valor, and five Good Conduct Awards. When I ask people who have worked with Eddie, they all say there is no greater, no more humble, focused, determined warrior that they've ever known. In fact, uh, I will tell you this, when we uh, first got to interview uh, Andrea, his wife, and his brother, Sean, on uh, when I was on the Team Never Quit podcast, man, it was awesome because the wizard had gone through buds with Eddie. And I remember Marcus and I asking them, hey, man, is wh what kind of guy is this? Is he squared away? And I remember the wizard looking us square in the face and saying, you know what? Uh, this is one of the best operators I've ever known in my life. So that's just one of the reasons why I, or a few of the main reasons why I have such profound and respect for uh, my brother in, in the SEAL teams, but more so as a man. Um, and I want to tell you why before we get into this interview. I want to tell you why I respect Eddie Gallagher so much as a man. First and foremost, when you begin to contemplate, really allow yourself to think about the effects you would feel by out of the blue getting thrown into the brig, essentially a uh, military jail uh, with no due process, with nobody telling you or explaining you what was going on and having to spend nine months in jail uh, and also knowing that your family's home was assaulted uh, in broad daylight, men with uh, submachine guns, pointing guns in his children's faces, his youngest son while he's in his underwear and his oldest son holding him, uh, his wife uh, threatened. Uh, and, and the way that NCIS handled this, man, this is an atrocity at every level. And, and the remarkable thing about Eddie Gallagher and more remarkable about his family is they didn't break. This monumental, monumentally defeating uh, 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 action, this assault on his civil rights, his rights as an operator, as an American hero to this nation, uh, as one of the most decorated, uh, successful operators, real world experience. He has the, the ultimate uh, um, uh, reputation and everything was taken from him based on a lie. Now, I don't know about you, but that is one of the most frustrating, disgusting aspects about our country today is that based on a lie, 
based on something that isn't true or not thorough investigations, or if someone decides that they want to target you, they can ruin your life instantaneously. And that's what they did to my brother, Eddie Gallagher. Now, you know, if you want to hear the entire story, there is no better place to listen to this entire story uh, than going to uh, Sean Ryan, the Sean Ryan show. He did a five hour interview with Eddie and his family uh, where Eddie talks through this whole thing. And if you really want to know more about this, then I highly recommend that you sign up right now. You pre-order his book, The Man in the Arena, From Fighting ISIS to Fighting for My Freedom. And this is the real story told by Andrea Gallagher and Eddie Gallagher about their intense ordeal and how they fought uh, tooth and nail uh, to expose the corruptness of the um, UCMJ, the corruptness of NCIS, and really the devastating effects of a few people within Naval Special Warfare to target Eddie without giving him the benefit of the doubt, without letting uh, this story uh, uh, really supporting the man that had supported the, the, the unit for as long as he did at the highest possible level. You know, this is a true story of triumph. This is a story of a real American hero. And a man, an American man, uh, just a man, and in, in, in my favorite part, uh, just a, a, an awesome Christian. Uh, and he, you know, this is uh, his incredible ordeal. So go out there, uh, pre-order the Man in Re- Arena. We don't know when it's going to be released because DOD is uh, doing its thing and holding it up uh, as per probably. Uh, they don't want the black eye. Um, but it's going to come out and you're going to be able to get this book. So support Eddie and his family by going uh, and pre-ordering the man in the arena. Now, in our conversation together, Eddie and I, man, I want to talk about uh, what it was like for Eddie t- uh, in writing the book and why he wanted to write the book and tell his story firsthand, uh, what uh, it, the effects it's had on him. I want to talk about his life and the transition that he's gone through from most of us, our, our transition is tough enough, much less going uh, from one minute you're you're put in for a silver star, you're sailor of the year, you're one of the top guys in the teams to uh, looking at life in prison for murdering an ISIS fighter. That's how ridiculous this was. And 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 talk about difficult transitions. And uh, within this, you know, I, I think I want you to get to know who Eddie is as a man, what kind of man he is. Uh, I want to, I want to talk, we're going to talk about his faith. We're going to talk about, uh, how he lives his life, how he focused, what he feels about Naval Special Warfare after this. Uh, I just, I'm telling you, you are going to absolutely love this interview. Um, I'm just so again, proud and honored, uh, to have Eddie, my friend come on. And I've been able to get to know him since we first, uh, I first met his wife and his brother, uh, and really got to know him a few years back at the Charlie Daniels fundraiser for their, their, uh, um, charity called the journey home project that he came up and spoke at it and was a part of it, man. It's just a, a wonderful human being. I'm so proud again and honored to know this man. And I truly believe that listening to this show is going to help you gain some insight and hopefully it's some inspiration, how you too can live your life. Now, before I jump into this, I just want to give my sponsor, uh, uh, the do and, and man, I am so incredibly honored and excited to be working with my medical images.com. Um, and you got to understand if you've had to deal with medical in- images over the last few years or last 30 years, really, you understand that you go, you get an x-ray, you got to request a CD, really CDs or aren't those things. So 1998 or what, man, and you got to get this CD, take it to your doctor, give it to the doctor who might not even be able to upload it. Cause he doesn't even have a CD driver in any of his computers or you don't. And then you leave it with them, forget it. And then you got to order another one. And then to transfer for a second opinion, you got to order another one and send it to that doctor through snail mail. Well, all of that is over. You know, think about it. Where do you keep the most valuable images in your life? You keep them on your, in your hand on your phone. Well, my medical images is going to help you do that. Now, uh, my medical images is a medical image sharing platform for patients and doctors. Uh, It was founded on the simple idea that people should be able to view, share, and manage a lifetime of medical images 
just like they do their personal photos. Essentially, what My Medical Images is, is the Instagram for your medical images. Think about it. All the times you've had orthopedic surgery or you've had mammograms or dental work or CAT scans from head injuries or you were in a car, you've had cancer, uh, you've had uh, MRIs and you're, you're, you know, all of these, these are critical images that you should be able to have in the palm of your hand and share with any doctor you want at any time. Now, uh, if you want uh, to sign up, man, please go to mymedicalimages.com. Normally, a year subscription is $29.95, and that's for you and everybody in your family can have a, 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 their images all in one place. Uh, all you got to do is go sign up, but get this, drum roll. Uh, you, if you use promo code FROGLOGIC, uh, and you use this code by June 1st, you will get a one-year free subscription. That's, let me say it again, a one-year free subscription at mymedicalimages.com by using the promo code FROGLOGIC. I'm telling you, since I got all my images uh, from the VA uploaded, uh, I, I, you know, I, I have all of them right there. So if I have to go see a neck specialist because my neck is jacked up or I go my knees or my lower back, Man, all I got to do is literally I can I can text my images uh, and we have these cool QR codes on each image that you can literally just QR code someone in real time, any doctor, any way, at any minute. And these are high level uh, HIPAA compliant images. Make sure you know that it's HIPAA compliant and uh, you will have control to be able to share, review and manage uh, your most important medical images in the palm of your own hand. So again, go over to My Medical Images, a one-year free subscription uh, if you use promo code FROGLOGIC. All right, everybody. Uh, I am so excited for this. I am super fired up. You are going to love this show. Uh, so what do you say? Let's get after it. hoo ya. My brother, I have just one question to start out with, man. That's it. I just have one. All right. I just have one. I, 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 I spent the last week contemplating what I was going to launch with, how I was going to dive into the most, the most, uh, 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 a challenging, uh, 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 operator of the, the modern era. And here is the question. Here is a question. What gives you the right <laughs> so that you think you can get out and write a better book than I did. That's what I want to know. <laughs> no, uh, you, you are, uh, that is the, uh, question that I've been dealing with internally. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been like this rain cloud over you. Oh my God. How is, how is my, incredible book about my just debilitating, uh, incredibly excruciating experience, uh, uh, going to compete with, with Dave's motivational self-help book. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Eddie, because of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. You're going to, you're going to shelve it right now. Forget all the pre-orders. You're going to refund everybody's money on the thousands and thousands of books that have already been ordered for you, but as in Dave's book. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, thank you so much for coming on with me oh good thank you for having me and i want to say one thing before we just like really get started is you know the when i was going through all that crap you and marcus you know um having my wife and my brother on i didn't even know that was really going on because i was locked up at the time but i'll tell you what when i finally got to listen to it Dude, it was, I can't explain it enough how much like that was such a ray of light to me to where I was like, yes, there are people, you know, on our side or that are looking out for us. I mean, because at the time that wasn't happening by a lot of people. And I just want to tell you, like, dude, from the bottom of my heart, I, I greatly appreciate what you did for my family. Wow, brother. It, it's, um, you know, hmm. It was probably one of the most important shows that I've ever been a part of in my whole life. Um, and I, I never forget when, you know, Melanie brought it up and, you know, I looked over at, at, at Marcus and we were at his ranch and, and I was just like, brother, man, uh, you know, this is ridiculous. This is crazy what's happening. And he's like, I, I can't believe it is. I, 
and he I was and he goes you know I, man there's so much going on what you know what what should we do and and Melanie's like well let you know just just get on the phone with Andrea and and talk to her and so I did and we spent an hour and a half on the phone together and after really 15 minutes of, of, of hearing your story and hearing her, her voice, right. The intensity, the, the rawness of, of that betrayal that was coming through her voice. And, and then the desperation within your brother, uh, you know, I was just like, man, this has got to happen. And then I'll never forget the, the kind of the, the, the final thing is we looked over at wizard and we said, Hey, do, do you know him? And he's like, hell yeah, I know him. And, and, and we're like, well, and he goes, um, he, this was, I, I don't want to mess misquote him. He goes, if there's anybody I've ever worked with in the entire community or in any other special operations unit I've ever been around, nobody's as squared away as Eddie is. And, and that was it. We, we were like, this has got to happen. Yes probably one of the highest compliments you can get from another team guy, you know? And yeah. Yep. He was with the wizards an awesome dude. I, I want to keep myself from saying his name. Yeah. <laughs> he, it, he, yeah, it was, it was one of those things that it was just, it felt so right. And, and thank God I, you know, uh, your, your, your wife and, and your brother have so much courage, right. To really come out and to, 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 um, really kind of tackle this head on and and thank God if, if they hadn't, man, you'd probably still be in the brig. I'd still be there. Yeah, for sure. If it wasn't for those two, I mean, those two are, those are my heroes. I mean, bottom line. Give me what, give me one little shit. Give me, yeah, just put it up there. I love when you, I, that's my favorite tattoo story of, of all tattoo stories, man, is your wife's eyes. Not tat, I wasn't tatted up at all either. 19 years. And I was like, that's, you know, cause it's always like something, I want to get something that's meaningful. And I was like, dude, this, if this isn't it, then <laughs> I'm like, then I'll never ever get a tattoo. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I was glad. And, yeah. Well, thank, thank God. And, uh, you know, thank uh, a lot of other, just the, the sequence of events. And I just want to give a big shout out to Bernie and, and Mark and, and, um, and Joe and, and just uh, your whole team for just getting behind you and making that happen. And then also the, you know, the former president and his help, but you know, that really comes down to now, I think is um, you know, after you've had this time to adapt and adjust and to kind of work through the, the whole process and we'll get into a transition here in a little bit, I'd love to just hop into the book itself and, and, you know, I guess this, the, the simple question, um, you know, obviously there's a, <laughs> there's a profound amount of people out there that, that believe that, uh, Navy SEALs should stop writing books. Operators shouldn't write books. You shouldn't be able to tell your story. You don't deserve it. You signed up. You should be anonymous. Always the silent professional stuff. So let's just dive right into that. And, and can you tell everybody why you wanted to write this book? So after obviously the trial and everything, and you know, it was such a whirlwind and a crazy time. I mean, my face was plastered everywhere all over the media. I mean, internationally, um, and I was sort of, I was lost. I mean, I was, you know, it looked like I was, I, I was holding it together and being strong. And that was like my ego, you know, from the SEAL teams. And I'm just like, you know, you're not, this isn't going to break me. Like, but internally, I mean, I was like, what is going like i don't know what to do and bernie carrick sat me down and he was like listen you need to write this story you need to tell what happened here because not only you know is it an unbelievable story but there's been so many lies so much misinformation he's like if you don't put out what actually happened then people are just going to believe what they saw in the you know in the media or what's being told you know or still what's being told to this day um you know, so I, I made the decision. I was like, okay, I want to write this. I'm going to write the book about what happened, you know, over the course of two years. Um, but my main goal for the book was to really shine a light on what my wife, my brother, the, all the people that surrounded me during this time and had my back, which sadly enough, I mean, it wasn't as many people as I thought, you know, would be, but that, you know, nonetheless, the amount of, you know, even the small amount of people that visited me every weekend in the brig, 
you know, just kept me from like losing my shit, uh, you know, bringing me, you know, I'd be in a state of depression and just having them visit me would like give me the strength to be like, okay, uh, let's just carry on and keep fighting this. Um, that's what I really wanted to shine a light on. And also, of course, of the curtain that we saw behind, which we didn't know existed, which is the UCMJ and just the system, how it works. And it's a lot of corruption, um, but also a lot of, you know, um, I don't know how to best describe it, but just because it's part of the military, it's militarily structured, then you're, no matter what, you're not going to get a fair shake. Even if you go in there and they're like, oh, okay, we'll just try them regularly. Because the way that system is designed, you're not going to get a fair shake. It's, you know, the defense works for the prosecution, who works for the judge, or, you know, vice versa. So when one side is not, you know, following the rules, the other side is scared to call them out because, and I I learned this right away, they're like, well, he might write my eval later on, so I don't want to get a bad eval or get bad remarks because... I called him out on something and I was dealing at the time, you know, I'm like, well, this is my life. I'm going away for life without parole, but you're scared to call him out for an eval. So, well, that's just an example of like how, how that system needs to be fixed. I think it's very archaic. Um, and I, I'm not, I'll be the first, I don't know the answer to it. I don't know how to fix that, but that's another reason why I wrote the book because I do believe there's some, there's some reform that needs to be done. Um, how much have you learned about the, the, I mean, obviously you learned an exorbitant amount about your own case and, and the function of your own case in terms of, of combating these, these just blatant lies, the act, you know, the act, the accusations, and then the, the, the altered testimony. Uh, and then the spying that, that for me was like, Oh, good God. Are you freaking kidding me? What, what have you learned about the UCMJ um, that, you know, that needs to be brought to the attention of, of either Congress or the Senate or somebody that can get in there and, and, and kind of begin to initiate these, these overhauls. Well, one, the first thing is the UCMJ was first formed, you know, first made to protect the active duty member. That's the reason we had it. So if, you know, we got charged with something overseas or, you know, were in battle and got charged. It was the military's way of being like, we got them, we'll bring them back. And then, but it was there to protect you. It wasn't there to really, I mean, if you did something wrong, you're going to get punished, but it wasn't there to punish you right off the start. Over the years, because of, I believe, the political, um, you know, the political grasp that, you know, has they have on the military and I think that has infiltrated so much into the UCMJ now where it has flip-flopped and it's like, well, now it's how many people can we prosecute in the military? How do we get our percentages up? How do we get that win? Because that's how these prosecutors pick up rank is how many wins they have. I think that right there is a huge fault because you shouldn't be picking up rank just by getting a win, because that means you're going to try to do it at all costs, which I saw firsthand. I mean, this guy, Chas Black, who was a prosecutor, I mean, the spying scandal was like, you know, the nail in the coffin, but there was, he was doing a million other things before that, that, you know, nobody was calling out or wasn't getting reported. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's one thing that I saw. I don't, I don't know how that gets fixed. I don't know if they need to bring in civilians or, you know, sort of change. The Hopefully. Way. Hopefully not civilians from our justice system, because that's even more broken, right? Good God. And that's and that's the uh, you know the crux of it right there is like, well, you know, I think our justice system also needs some reform as well. Uh, I just you know I I don't know that, and I I was first I don't know the answer to fixing it. I just know it needs to be fixed. I just know that people need a fair they need a fair trial. They need due process. Um, they you know you have rights even though you're an active duty member. Um, but that's the other, you know, because you're in the military, you are already prone to just taking it. You know, you're like, oh, well, all right, they're they're screwing me again. I mean, you know, each branch has their own version. You know, the Marines, it's like, oh, the big green weenie got me again. Or, you know, the Navy, whatever they say, you know, I got fucked over again. That's, the, the military knows that. So they, when they lock you up for no reason, they start you know, violating your rights, um, violating your family's rights, 
they're banking on the fact that you're not going to say anything because they're like, you're in the military, you just take it. And what we did, or my wife, my wife did is Andrea, she was like, no, 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 I'm not in the military. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to call you out for everything that you're doing. And I don't think they, they weren't ready for that. They were like, Oh, what's going on here? This person's fighting back, like, and calling us out and they didn't know how to handle it. They, so instead of being, you know, being like, okay, she's right. All right, let's stop doing this right now. They just doubled down and like, well, now we're going to spread all this misinformation to the media because we want people on our side. She's calling us out for our misgivings. Now we're going to get the media to be in control of the narrative. And that's, I mean, that was going on the whole time too. I mean, she, her and my brother fought a beast. I mean, she, they, they took on the United States government and the media, which is not Don't a media. whammy. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess, but you know, the question, I, I really don't know what, what needs to be done. I, I will just keep, we're just going to keep pounding the drum. Like, Hey, something does need to be done here. And, you know, hopefully as we go along the way, we'll come to some decision. I'm like, okay, you know, this is, they'll change this or they'll change this, you know, and hopefully that'll be for the better. But, uh, until well, then. it was interesting, you know, after I, I, you know, kind of, I did, we did your guys show, you know, I, I was approached by some other people, you know, that were going through not the same level, but certainly, you know, getting screwed over some, some Marsoc folks that are, yeah. and, and, and that just was like, whoa, this is really, it's, it, it's, this is prevalent. And, and through the, the entire, I mean, it's at every unit and every, in every branch at every level, um, this, this is a problem. And, and now what I think, you know, is really nerve wracking to me is, you know, after the, the January 6th, uh, situation, um, at the Capitol and, and many of the people in particular, like the, the young girl, who's the air force vet who got shot in the throat, you know, in this by, you know, completely unarmed. And, and we still don't know who that is or what's going on. It just, it, it, and now like, whoa, um, you know, we have to purge the military. We've got to, and that's kind of the narrative. And on that 60 day stand down that can, we've got to purge the military of, of all the, the ne'er do wellers in there. And, and so I'm like, whoa, th it's almost as if now they're saying, oh, we're not going to, after our lesson, we learned from, from this, the insanely worldwide public, uh, debacle we had with, with senior chief Gallagher, we're going to double down and we're just going to get rid of all the potential troublemakers that we think are the troublemakers right now. I yeah. Mean, I mean, it's yeah. To this day, you know, and I, I have guys reaching out to me from the community, new guys, uh, you know, younger guys, or even guys that are going through, uh, leadership courses like the LPO course, they're literally going in and this is, uh, this is, I wish I was making this up. They're going in. It's the Commodore and one of the accusers are going to each class pre presenting a whole day of smear Eddie Gallagher and he's guilty. He got away with it. He is like the worst. I mean, they're putting this out to the students. Still, still two, now, currently. Uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. So this is, and th this is, I think, and like, it's, I, it's hard, like, I don't even get mad about it or anything. I'm just like, I feel sorry for them. Cause I'm like, dude, if you would just let it go and continue on with what the mission is supposed to be, it's not me. It's not, you know, you know, you're, you're dragging this on for no reason. But the problem is the guys themselves are seeing right through it which is why they're calling me and they're like, why do they keep saying this? And I'm like, dude, I tell them like, just carry on, do what you, you know, do what you signed up for. Um, they're it's, I mean, what it comes down to Dave is ego, right? It's, I mean, all that's long. their, their ego was crushed because my wife and my brother defeated them. And instead of licking their wounds and being like, you know what, let's just carry on They're like you said, doubling down and still trying to create this narrative. Um, and I don't, you know, and that's the other reason I wrote the book is, you know, in the book, it's going to have every little thing that they did. And <clears throat> what's really cool is if people, you know, cause it's my side of the story, 
obviously. So people can be like, oh, this guy's just saying this. I put in, there's QR codes in the book. You can go ahead and, you know, uh, take your phone out, get the QR code. You'll be able to listen to every NCIS uh, interview, watch every, every NCIS interview, listen to all the trial audio, all the evidence. Like I'm going to, it's like, here it is. You know, you can, you know, you can take my word or I'll just give it to you full on. And you know, a lot of that stuff, not a lot, but some of it doesn't make me look good, but you know, I'm not, I'm like, I'm the first to admit, I'm not a perfect person. I'm constantly trying to grow and be a better man. But this, what happened to my family should scare you. It literally should scare every active duty member because we, it just happened. I mean, it happened like that. It was for, for me and, and, and anybody. So, you know, you know, obviously everybody's kind of, if you're not familiar, you haven't heard the story yet. Uh, I, I can't do it justice. Uh, the, there is no better interview out there, uh, than go to the Sean Ryan show where Eddie and Sean did a five hour, two part, <laughs> two part show where Eddie walks you through, you know, the entire, the entire piece. So go there, listen to this. And, and for me, the, the real kind of the benchmark of, of that fear that you're speaking of was the description when your son came on and talked about being in his underwear and having assault weapons, you know, or, or, you know, what black guns pointed in his face as, as his older brother carried him outside as if he was some sort of terrorist. Yeah, like or, and, 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 and for me that that's like, you know, I, I, that is scary. Oh, yeah. It's proof positive that this person who has, has dedicated his entire existence and a certain, a certain, uh, a certain, uh, not a, a, a high level of his family's lives to serving the country in, in the highest operational tempo that we've seen since Vietnam, um, it, it, they're all fair game. Yeah. Like that's, and that's what, what I talked about before. They think they can just run roughshod over you because you're in the military. So, and there's a thing called, I don't know, a lot of people don't know about this and I didn't either. It's called the Ferris Act, which you are not allowed to sue the military for anything. So, that's NCI. So the agent who conducted that raid knew that he's like, it doesn't matter. Like, even if, even if this is the wrong thing to do, what you can't do anything to me. And oh. you, like, I can't sue them for pulling my kids out and gunpoint or underwear. I can't sue them for whatever trauma they caused to my kids. I mean, it's that, that act is there. And so, you know, it's, uh, well, here's what we need to do. All right. First and foremost, we need to get old Dan Gallagher on the horn or some other, other soft guy, call up Ron DeSantos or whatever. And we need to get some folks in bo on board this to it, put an amendment to that Ferris act for this, just this purpose to be able to have, uh, some civil rights. Cause that's what it was. I mean, this was a civil rights violation top to bottom and they knew it, like you said, to be able to give a course of action, which at least puts these idiots on notice that this is not acceptable. Exactly. And I mean, and that's, that's what the book is for as well. It's like, here's my version and this is me holding you guys accountable. You know, this is what you did. And I've had, you know, I've had people reach out that know they're going to get named in the book that did, you know, and th these are good lead, like they were good leaders, but they made some really bad decisions during this time. And they've reached out to me, not well through a third party. And they're like, Hey, can you, can we have a sit down and talk? And I said, yeah, for sure. We can wow. sit down and talk and are we going to be let bygones be bygones, but your name isn't coming out of the book. Like this happened. And they're like, well then forget it. So I was like, exactly. That's, that's what this comes down to. You know, um, everybody wants something. Yeah. And that's it. Like, well, I'm holding you accountable. If you're not going to do it yourself, then I'm going to do it for you because wow. this is what, you know, this is what you guys did. Um, and that, you know, the, the book itself is mainly focused around the trial, uh, and everything. So it's focused on a deployment before and leading up. Um, I got chapters in it from my wife, uh, and my brother, Bernie, my legal team, you know, I, everyone has, there's guys that I was in the brig with have a chapter in there just so they, 
their their uh, version of what was going on, how I was being treated in the break. Because again, I don't think people will believe it when I say, you know, they're like, no way. And I'm like, yes, you know, this happened every day when this guy describes how I was getting strip searched every day, getting just pushed around, trying trying to get me to snap um, to so they could point the finger. So they could be like, oh, this guy's crazy. I mean, living with that every day for seven months is, uh, it, it was pretty nuts. Um, but, but I knew during that time, I got told at least by a guard, like, this is what they're trying to do to you. So I knew it was a game. So I, thank God, God gave me the fortitude to keep my mouth shut and just like Amen. carry on. <laughs> well, I what, what the fucking irony in all this, right? Is that here you are, one of the most <laughs> experienced hardened operators that our community's ever produced, right? <laughs> like in nine combat deployments, right? And and I mean, you can you I mean, you think about the places you've been and the 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 op tempo that you've been involved in and the intensity of that conflict, the 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 vitriol and of of warfare and you never once quit in any one of those situations in fact you got better and better and better and so here they think these trivial little games are going to be the thing that gets you it's just it's crazy that was so like how goofy the whole thing was i mean i had these e5s who you know they're you know making little comments to me or like I said, strip me naked, saying stuff to me. And I'm looking at him like, just smiling. Like, is that, are we done? Like, can I go back to my cell? Cause and they would, I mean, their faces were like, Oh, this guy's, this is not working, you know, but it, it's that saying, I was like, you know, kill him with kindness and then torture him with success. That's Amen. It. Amen. Well, well, what do you, what do you hope the outcomes for? Obviously I I'm praying that your book is a, an, a, bestseller and that it gives you guys the, the 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 cushion and some relief for finances and just really you, you you get the payback that you deserve for for the government wrongfully taking seven months away from you and your your family i think that's that's worth a few million dollars in in, in my book for sure um but what are the outcomes when 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 somebody who is not you know let's say let's do let's do two questions first one the person that uh, isn't in the military, that aren't familiar with first responders, cops, or firefighters, that don't know the mentality, what do you want them to feel after reading it? And then what do you want people uh, from from the soft community to, to take away from the book? Um, so I'd say from the civilian side that who really have no clue how the military works or, um, or if they're you know, thinking about joining the military, that... <clears throat> The military is not a perfect system. It's a bunch of human beings just like you that decided to join. Um, just because somebody picks up rank and is in charge doesn't make them God, doesn't give them the ability to cast decisions and judgment, you know, because they're, you know, they're in charge and they're protecting the institution. Uh, but also, you know, in the book, I also want them to know that a large majority, I'd say the most percentage of the people in the military are there for the same reason, you know, these people are joining is to protect this country for the love of this country, um, for the love of the guy or girl standing to the right or left of them. Um, that's what I try to convey in the book as well. Like how I was raised in the military and I'm sure how you were raised. It's like, this is, especially in the teams and even my time in the Marine Corps when I was a medic, it's, this is a brotherhood, you know, we're, we're here together. We're here to die for one another. I don't, know if there's any other you know form of love that's greater than that you know it's like i'm i'm here to give my life for you and i even if you have different beliefs than me you're a different skin color you you know your different political beliefs uh it doesn't matter to me like once we go on deployment and the bullets start flying like none of that matters it's like me and you and we're both go i'm gonna make sure you go home and you're gonna make sure i go home um that's i hope the civilians can get out of that. Like, this is why you should join, or if that's what you're looking for, that does exist, you know, but just know it's not a perfect system. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are bad apples and every, it doesn't matter if you want to go work for Google, there's bad apples there. I'm sure, you know, um, that's, that's what I want to get people, you know, the civilians to get out of it for the soft operators. I hope to God I did, I did them justice by writing this book. I, 
I tried my very best to sort of describe our mindset. Um, and I just, for the soft drivers, I want them to know the truth. Like, hey, this is what happened. And these are, this is, you know, the steps that happened afterwards to where, how I got in prison. And, you know, it should, it should scare them. It should, or make them nervous a little bit. Uh, and that they should be, you know, wary of, I guess, trust uh, a little bit. Like, just keep your, like I I always, I always said, it's, you know, keep your circle small. No one gets in, no one gets out. Uh, and that's, I hope that that's what soft rockers get out of it. Wow. That, that's, you know, I, it's so, uh, you know, I, I've been, I've been kind of in this game for, for a long time now. And, and, you know, the, the, there's always that duality, right. And, and how we approach everything we do. It's always like, you know, uh, you know, for me, for the longest time, it was, you know, I just don't want to let my brothers down. I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to ever have any guy look at me say, or, or talk about me and say, you know, Oh, Rut's just this or Rut's just that, you know, I, 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 I you know, and that was a big driving force for so long. And so, but then I began to realize, well, you know, there's always going to be the people who call you out for certain yeah. things. There's, there's always going to be, you can't hold that off, but what really matters is, is, is the men, you know, the brothers that, that know you, that worked with you, that believe in you and recognize that, you know, what you're really trying to do and how you're trying to do it. And so, you know, I, I just hope and pray, man, that, you, that, that happens for you. I, I certainly know uh, I couldn't be more proud to call my name, myself a Navy SEAL and couldn't be even more proud to call myself a friend of yours. So, you know, I feel the same exact way, brother. For Amen. Sure. Okay. Uh, Before we, we, we move on, um, where can people get the book? Uh, and then tell us a little bit, actually tell us where we're at in the book, uh, in terms of DOD approval and, and then where they can get it and when it's going to come out and all that. Sure. And now can I just add like one more little thing for the book? Yeah, please. It's, um, what I mainly focus or not mean, but really focused on when writing the book was my faith and like being faith-based. Um, that's honestly like all the Navy SEAL training in the world, all the soft training in the world, everything that we go through did not prepare me for what I went through the past two years. Like I could not have done that on that training alone or like that Eagle alone, you know, and I think I've, I've heard it from a couple people like, Oh, you're a SEAL, you know, you're, you'll be fine. You know, being in prison for seven months, you should have been all right. No, I wasn't like, I wasn't all right. Like I was, you know, going through turmoil in my head. And because I was a SEAL, because I had that ego, I was like trying to control the situation, like, you know, trying to fight my way out of it when really I had, it was like, you know, punching air because it was making no, made no difference. Like, and I finally realized like, dude, I don't have any control here. And I gave it all to God. I spoke out loud to him in my cell. And I've still, you know, I've told this many times and I'll never stop telling it because it was such a remarkable moment for me. You know, I talked to him out loud. I gave everything to him. And I was like, this is, I'm all my faith and trust is in you as it should be. And I I physically felt like not, oh, I, I think I feel better. No, I physically felt the weight come off of me. Like God just took it. And I walked out of that cell and the rest of my time, like it wasn't easy, but I had God like pushing me through it. Like, you're fine. Like no matter what happens, you're fine. I got you. And that's what I really, and that's how we've tried to live our lives, you know, and we have our ups and downs, um, you know, especially me, my wife, she is like a freaking rock star. Uh, she's the one who really drove me to the Lord. Um, and, but yeah, like we've tried to live our lives like that. But for me, that, that moment was like, no, this, this is it. Like, this is it. This is real. You know, God, you know, faith is real, you know, uh, full vulnerability is real. Like that it's, that's what helped me get through it. Um, and I try to like put that in the book and I, I give a couple chapters of, you know, how faith was sort of intertwined in my career as well. Man. Um, you know, I was, I was, you know, just to, just to let you know, <laughs> and I've told you this before I texted you uh, a few months ago, 
um, you know, going through the whole thing of, of social media with me and, and, and then also, you know, through the whole, you know, just tumultuousness of, of um, you know, the, the fear of where what's happening in the country. And, and when, when I listened to you tell that story on, on, uh, on Sean's show, um, you know, what, what's incredible is that your, your words, they, they washed over me and I felt better in, in my pain by hearing your trust in God. And then, and then now all of a sudden I, I feel it through your words. And, and that's what I hope mostly comes out of your story is that, you know, here is one of the most, you know, you know, accomplished warriors that we have in our country and, and you, but yet none of all of that pales in comparison to the, 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 the grace that you feel in God's presence in your heart. And that is palpable. That was the moment for me where it's just like, my God, this is, he's speaking the truth and that's the truth. And I, when we, and when we're allowed to speak the truth, we prevail. And the truth is God is great and Christ is real. And, and man, I just, it, it, it I hope, you know, when we talk about outcomes, I hope, I hope people feel what, what I felt in hearing your story and especially that story in particular, brother. Well, that, I mean, just hearing that from you made doing the podcast with Sean worth it. Just if I could help, you know, it's like if it helps one person, especially someone like you, the vote. I mean, to me, I'm like just being around you. It's always like uplifting for me. I'm like, oh, this guy, seriously, you know, <laughs> they say to surround yourself with people who, you know, help, you know, help or uh, uplift your spirits and make you a better person. I mean, I met you for the first time at the event in Nashville. We the had Journey dinner. Home Project. Yeah, Charlie's event. Just that, like, our conversation or whatever I had with you, like, I told Andrew, I'm like, dude, just being around him, it's like this force of, like, <laughs> I feel better, you know? That's cool. Yeah. The, Jeff Enderlin, old Indy, used to call me the, um, he called me the uh, grenade of positivity. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Well, you know, the beauty of all this is that we, we, you know, these bonds and, and these are really, I think the most critical aspects of our experience is, is not necessarily how many confirmed kills you have or how many missions you've done or how many deployments you have or how many medals you got on your chest is really about it, it. It's rooted in these bonds that are created between men and, and the bonds that are created in the most difficult situations known to existence, which is combat and warfare, um, it, you know, those bonds are really what enable us to make these transitions to become more devout, to become more wise, right? That wisdom with growth. Um, but unfortunately, I think uh, the, the, you know, the, the transition of of living in that space where you're you're completely inundated with that that hyper focus or hyper vigilance right uh, that that perpetual limbic state that's on of 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 being better being better and then the peer review that's a part of that and and then all of a sudden you know you get out and then and then you're over here and there's there the support's not there that's we've seen it's so devastating for so many of our friends what I want to ask you, because I've never, I don't know anybody that even remotely got close to your transition. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, tra man, my transition suck, bro. I mean, one minute I'm, you know, I'm in Afghanistan the next summer I'm home, you know, in my par living at my parents' house, you know, drinking a bottle of tequila and riding my motorcycle going hundred miles an hour, trying to kill myself. And, and, and I, I was like, what the hell, but I can't even fathom the intensity of your transition. Can you, can you kind of describe that a little bit for us? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best for sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, when, <laughs> yeah, the transition was definitely, uh, different and not one that I had planned out for my exit of the military, uh, at all. 
you know, when I was going through <clears throat> all of that, you know, when I was locked up, I mean, I remember guys were visiting me and they were like, how are you doing? Like, how are you doing? You know, how, you know, and they were like legitimately concerned. And of course, like any team guy, I'm fine. I'm good. You know, like I'm good. And I kept saying that all the way up to my day of retirement, even as much as I was getting fucked with, I mean, I was getting messed with till the day I got my retirement ID, you know, the command was coming after me. Um, and I, I thought I was, you know, I was like, you can't, you're not going to break me. Like I'm good. I got my retirement ID and I said, you know, I talked about this on Sean Ryan's podcast. I think I, you know, got it, walked out to my truck and literally broke, I broke down. I was like crying like a freaking three-year-old, you know, cause I couldn't, I couldn't believe, I was like, this, this is it. It's over. You know, like I'm no longer part of the club anymore. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I went, <laughs> went home. Uh, there was like that two months of, uh, you know, um, what do they call that? What is it after you, I came up drawing a blank. The honeymoon, honeymoon. The phase. honeymoon, yeah, yeah. Honeymoon phase of retirement. Like, oh, okay. Like now there's something new and I, I was doing okay. It was probably like two or three months after my retirement is when I started really noticing. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm not good. Like I'm having issues. And it wasn't even me really self realizing that it was my wife and kids who were like, you are messed up. Like there's, and my wife as the world knows has doesn't mince her words. Uh, <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> yeah. God bless her. She, uh, <laughs> she let me know. She's like, you, there's, there's something wrong with you and you need to like address it. And so she ordered me, she was like, you will not do anything this year except fix yourself. You have not taken care of yourself for 20 years. And I haven't, you know, I think that's one of the curses of being a medic as well as I'm very good at diagnosing other people and helping them, but I am the worst patient for myself. Like I'm, Amen. you know, so I had to go back and dig through 20 years of shit that I had just put in the caboose, you know, like, yeah, I'm good. Just put that away. Don't think about it ever again. Um, and it was, it was difficult. It was, uh, it wasn't easy. Um, I went and I went and signed up for a bunch of treatments. I did the high, you know, H bot, hyper mm -hmm. chamber. Um, I found one, you know, thank, thank God in Destin right here. Uh, cause COVID hit, I was going to come out to the 22 project, mm -hmm. uh, but because of COVID, the restrictions of travel, I wasn't able to. And then I also, uh, went to a pretty intense treatment, the Ibogaine, um, in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, took that, that was definitely helpful. Um, gave me a, it gave me like a base to where I'm like, this is how I should feel. I sh like, it, I was at ease. Um, but obviously when you go back, go back to the real world that, that can skyrocket back up, but it gave me that like, okay, I'm feeling this right now, meditate or, you know, get back down to this level, uh, where I should be at. And, uh, also taught, I talked to Dr. Chris, you know, once a week, that guy's a saint. I mean, that right, He's that right there has helped me. And I think that's one of the hardest things. What well, was one of the hardest things for me to do, and I, I'm sure, sure it's most team guys is, um, admitting you need help admitting, like, I can't do this. I need someone to talk to, or, and especially if it's not another team guy, it's mm -hmm. like, whoa, and I, I was struggling with that, with talking to Dr. Chris, but the more I got to talk to him and that, you know, it was my wife, you know, Andrea even said, she's like, I can see the biggest improvements in you, you know, as, as this goes on. Um, so, you know, the transition itself was, was crazy. Uh, especially dealing with like all the, you know, not just like the 20 years of service and like trying to unpack all that, but then, also the two last two years of my name getting smeared everywhere and like everybody knowing who I was, um, mm -hmm. it, it was, you know, I, I couldn't walk through the airport without people like, Oh, like point, which ever, it was all positive. It wasn't nothing. Nobody's ever said anything negative. It was all, but even was, it was very uncomfortable for me because I'm not the most, uh, smart. you're the antithesis of it, brother. Yeah. I was like, and I'm not the most like outgoing, like, Hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sociable, but only when I really get to know you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was very hard to deal with, um, you know, but my wife, 
kept telling me, she's like, this, and it's the truth, this all happened for a reason because we are going to make some positive changes out of this nightmare. We are going to do good going forward. And she's like, in order for you to do that, you have to like get over this hump of not wanting like to be known. Like it's already too late. So you can use what happened to you for good and just embrace the fact that everybody knows who you are and that, you know, people do want to talk to you. They do want to know the story. Um, so, and, and that's, and I'll tell you what, Dave, like that is still ongoing to this day. Like it, I'm not completely over it, you know, it's, and I'll, I'll, I'll be, Oh, how could you be? And I'll, I'll be straight up honest. Like I, when we talked the other day on the phone, I, you know, everything's all good. Um, that next day I was working out in the garage and the, the chains of depression, like hit me just like that. Like I, no, it was no, nothing triggered it. Nothing like it was just, I started going down this hole and it took, you know, it took me like a 24 hours to get out of it. And my wife and kids saw it. They're like, you know, Andrew's like, Oh, here we go again. Like the, the, who's, who are we talking to today? You know? And so, yeah. Oh, I, I know it well, man. I had a, I had one last week myself, man. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know how long they're going to last. It could be 30 minutes. It could be two hours. It's whenever my brain stops producing the cortisol and the epi and the norepi. And, and then I'm able to gain control. Like I had to go for like a six mile walk and yep. at, at like, at like mile four, I'm at the end of this jetty in Boca Raton and, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm just breathing and I'm looking at the water and then I'm praying. And then finally I can, I come off it. Yeah. And then I can start thinking clearly again, man. Exactly. And it, it's crazy while you're going through that, like, you know, like for me, when I'm going, I'm like, I know it's happening. I'm like, I know that, like, I'm not in the right mind right now, but it's, it's very hard to come out of it, you know, and I'm trying to get out of it, you know, for like I was for the past 24 hour, the 24 hours I was going through it the other day. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, but I'll tell you what, that's improvement. Like that, that would have like back in the day would have lasted me probably a week, you know, of just being like, don't talk to me. Like I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now I've got it down to 12 to 24 hours. And then hopefully, you know, that'll just keep shrinking as I go on. And that's, Oh, it will for sure. It will. And I think that's what like operate, you know, guys that get out, you know, soft guys or even, you know, grunts, guys who've seen, you know, combat and have had to live that life. It doesn't end like this doesn't ever go away. This is part of what when you signed up for the military and you're like, I'm willing to give everything. This is part of everything you. Yeah. And so that's how it, when I, I came up with the Sikh battle, it's like brand or whatever you want to call it. It's because you are constantly seeking battle. Like even when you get out, you are still in the fight, except this time it's the fight for, you know, for you, your, your uh, sanity, just you being a better man, being a better husband, you have to constantly fight for that. Um, it's not going to go away, you know? And, Amen. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, you have to have a mission. We have to have a mission. No, no doubt. And, and what I love is, and, and, you know, I think we're so blessed not only, you know, to have Dr. Free in our lives, you know, to help us on an individual basis, but, you know, his, his authoring the paper on operator syndrome was like this complete, uh, you know, light that went off for all of us. Cause now we're like, Oh, you mean this feeling that I get that shifts my entire identity there, there are reasons for this blast wave exposure for 20 years. Uh, uh, and my, my endocrine system, my, my, my pituitary gland is shot out. Cause there's, it's, it's been corroded with cortisol or, you know, my digestive tract is I have, I have so much, uh, bad, uh, bacteria in my gut from the hell holes I've operated in for that. Oh, that affects my depression too. Wait, wait, wait. And my sleep apnea. Wait, what do you mean? And it's like, it's like this, this light goes off and you're like, Oh, Oh my God. I, I have operator syndrome. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and it's that beautiful awakening. And I, I just, you know, would you, could you help us understand how, you know, that recognition has really led you in, in creating the pipe hitter foundation. Yep. So the, uh, pipe hitter foundation, we, so when we were going through the trial, it was this, that the idea for that foundation started before we even went to trial, we were, uh, Andrew and I, and my brother were all discussing, I mean, 
just what they had to do to get me a fair trial, to get me due process, which is they had to, you know, go on the news, go on the media, um, advo- you know, get a bunch of people to advocate for us, you know, go on podcasts with you. Like that's a ton and ton of work. And, you know, I was blessed, um, that I had Andrea as a wife and Sean as a brother, like I, and not everybody has that, right? Not everybody has a wife or a brother or family as strong as my family or like, not, you know, and not to put down anybody's family up there. Yeah. Strong, but I mean, the courage, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to put your life on hold for someone else's life. Exactly. So what we said, you know, we, our idea was like, we need to do this for other people because when I was locked up, I met tons of sailors, Marines, soldiers, and uh, air force people that were in there that didn't belong. They were in there because of the corrupt system. Now, there is a lot of people that do belong in there, but there, you'd be surprised the amount of people that are in there serving like eight years that for adultery. You know, it's like eight years for adultery. Like, come on. Um, so we were like, that's it. We need to form a foundation that's going to advocate for people when they're being accused or unjustly accused to provide, le- you know, legal funds. And that's, that's another thing when I was going through that whole mess. The Navy SEALs Fund, uh, Drago and Rachel Desirian, they pretty much dropped everything and raised money for us wow. that whole time. Um, and these these are people, I, Drago, I didn't know him. You know, he's a prior team guy, but mm-hmm. it's like we didn't know each other. And I mean, I just, that was some more divine intervention, that, you know, that they, they decided to take this on. Um, that money that they raised, like, I can't, if they didn't do that, we we would be living in a cardboard box right now with the legal fees that we had. I mean, it was almost wow. a million dollars. And, wow. And so, and that's the other thing. <clears throat> the government knows that we don't have the money to um, pay for high, you know, high lawyers and um, high price lawyers is what you need when you're, especially going into a case like mine, the murder case, they know that we can't afford that. So that's, they sit there and run the bill up or like put these roadblocks and so you would have to dish out more money for the lawyer. And they're like, well, eventually you're going to run out of money and that's going to be it. And then we're going to come after you. Um, it's, and it's pretty sick to think about, but that's, that's the way it goes. So we also, for the Pipe Foundation, will raise money for your legal defense and also emergency relief funds. So wow. while you're going through this, you know, whatever small problems or big problems your wife and kids are having at home while you're, while you're dealing with this or vice versa, the husband and wife or wife and husband, um, we'll provide, you know, money for, to pay the bills or, you know, as, or to as little as something as dog sitting, you know, like if you need to go to court and you need someone to watch your dogs, huge, you know, we'll, we'll pay for that. But so we created that, um, <clears throat> we got, a amazing board, um, you know, uh, Mark Mukasey, one of my lawyers is on the board. Um, I got another team guy, um, on the board, Carl Higby. Um, John, who went through his own challenge, right? Oh yeah. He knows all about it. I mean, he wrote a book about it. Yep. Um, and And you can find Carl, everybody, if you haven't, if you don't know Carl, you can find Carl on Newsmax. He's got a great show on Newsmax. Yeah. He's just an awesome, awesome individual. Um, Tommy Marquez, who was uh, Duncan Hunter's assistant. Um, so that board, um, we also have Rob O'Donnell. He's a a cop, uh, was a retired cop in New York. And so that board, we review all the cases and the grants. Uh, I think once a month, we're moving to twice a month. And then if we're like, yep, we want to help this person, then that's it. We will start, you know, uh, raising money for you. Um, Obviously, this last year with COVID, it was real difficult to raise money, but we're still chugging along. Um, You know, we're getting people donating all the time just through uh, emails and everything else, which we're completely grateful for. But hopefully this year we'll be able to open it up a little bit and, uh, get some uh, more donations too. Cause we got a lot of people waiting, not waiting, but on the list that we want to start helping out. How, how, how many, I mean, what are we talking about? How many people do you believe are within the UCMJ system that are getting, that are, are unfairly been accused? Um, it's, it's hard to put a number on it, but I mean, as far as the, the people that we're helping right now, I would say just last year and into this year, we've, we've probably helped like six or seven and wow. that's the UCMJ. We're also helping uh, 
law enforcement officers, especially during this last year, because of the whole agenda, you know, and you know, fund the police. It's insanity. You know, the BLM movement, everything, it, the cops were being pretty much attacked. And so there's a lot of guys, a lot of uh, law enforcement officers who are awaiting trial right now for nothing for, I mean, doing their job. And then someone's like, Oh, I don't like the way you handcuff that person. And that's it. Like that accusation alone is like, you just lost your job. Uh, so wow. we're helping, we're helping them out. You know, we got, there's a couple in San Diego that we're helping out right now. Um, and we, you know, every month we get a, a new influx of people that need help. And obviously we, we sort through them and we do our due diligence. And I, I've been asked the question before, like, well, what if they're actually guilty? You know, you know what? And this is what I tell people. And I've had, so we've, I've helped team guys out uh, this past year as well. I, we've probably helped like three team guys. Wow. And, you know, leave it up to the, <laughs> the community. I get calls right away. Like, don't help that guy. He's a piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. And this is what I tell people. And this is what I tell the guys. I'm like, you can go ahead and leave your opinions about him. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like what's happening to him and his family is wrong. Like, I don't care if this guy, you know, you think he's a horrible operator or you think he's, you know, whatever. I'm like that, that has nothing to do with what we're doing. We, we are helping this family out because they are in need right now. And you know what, if he is guilty, at least we did something to help them. You know, we're not saying, we're not saying they're guilty or not guilty. Like they're going to get their day in court. Yep. But we can at least help them out along the way. Help That's them get there. Brothers do for each other. Like, Amen. You know, I'm not sitting here casting judgment on you. I just want to help you and your family out. You know, one of the things, and, and God bless you for that. I, I just think it's such a needed space. I mean, so many people's lives are just utterly destroyed by the corrupt justice systems out there from family practice to, you know, criminal to civil. It's just, it's unchecked. And the more money you have, the more damage you can do. And, now with these political uh, George Soros appointed uh, uh, DAs, uh, you know, no cash bail, and and they're trying to revoke the the protections on police officers. I mean, it's it's going to turn into a free for all, which it is. And I, I just read an article in a major news source that says uh, uh, crime is uh, in Atlanta is uh, violent. Uh, gun homicides are up thirty seven percent. It's a uh, 55% or something like that in uh, um, New York and like 60 something in Chicago. I saw that. I mean, these are astronomical numbers and, and, and the result is, is because police are afraid to do their jobs. And, and when, what's it going to look like if operators are afraid to do their jobs downrange? What, what's that going to turn into? Yeah. And that was a big um, concern of mine when I was going through my case and I, I tried to articulate as best I could in like my first interview after the trial and, and it was a horrible interview, but I, my, my concern was like the, I, I don't want guys scared to pull the trigger when they're down range because they're like, well, if I do this, I can go away for life when they should be pulling the trigger, you know? And then because they hesitated, one of their teammates died or somebody, you know, a bomb was, you know, an IED was planted because you didn't take that guy out. Uh, that's, that's a huge, you know, huge thing for me um, because I'm no longer going down range, but I still have my best friends at all. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want that in the back of their mind. They, they're worried about 10 million other things. Uh, that one hesitation is all it takes, man. Half a second of delay is, is the difference between life and death, man. Exactly. Well, you know, I think one of the things I, I'd love to just kind of finish this on is really to you know, I, I think what I, I always am concerned with is, is the misrepresentation that, uh, uh, you know, certainly people at, at the New York Times and other places have, have tried to uh, align you with. And then also, I, you know, the, the, the other thing, with, you know, is just the stuff that's happening within the community, you know, that people are going to somehow say, oh, he just, He's going to bash him every chance he gets. He hates NSW. He can't stand this. He, you know, he, he, there's no such thing as the brotherhood and, you know, uh, you know, screw the SEAL teams. And that's not accurate. And I'd no. love it if you could just tell the listeners, you know, how you feel about, about the community and, 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 and the SEAL teams. 
Um, so <clears throat> I, it's hard for me to describe like in words, how I feel about the SEAL teams in the community. Cause I'm like, so it's ingrained in me. I, I love it. You know, I mean, put it this way. When I was in, I put the SEAL community above my family at all. And that's, that's hard for me to say now, but that's, that's the truth. That's a God, God honest truth that that was, that was it. Like that was my belief system. Um, that's and, what we're told to do, told to do from day one, right? Where that's programmed in us. It, it's, it's, it's your, it's the mission. Uh, and then everything else. Exactly. And you know what, that, that feeling has only changed slightly. It's my family is first. And then I still have the same love for the SEAL teams. Like I, I, st I have no ill will towards the community. I have no, like, if anything, I want to, you know, keep bringing them up and, and, Praising them for the, I mean, those are our nation's heroes. Same as Green Berets, Rangers, you know, every per, every person that joins the military is our nation's heroes. But those guys, I mean, soft community is definitely, I think, a level above the rest when it comes to the willingness, the drive to do whatever it takes to defend this nation. And, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I have no ill will towards the, the SEAL teams. And, you know, I, I realize... <clears throat> especially some probably certain members that are, you know, active duty guys that are still in, they're probably looking at me like, Oh, look at this guy. Now he's writing a book and blah, blah, blah. And like going off, you know what? That's fine. You can have, I, I and I completely understand that attitude. I was, I was one of them as you know, in the mix, like you're in that environment and that hate train and you're just like everything outside the seal teams is like, like, don't, you know, it's, it's shit. Everybody. This is all that matters. Uh, <laughs> I try and I really try and convince people and tell people, Hey, you know, guess what, man? I, you know, my, my, I was an angry person when I was in the SEAL teams. Man. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was a nasty uh, son of a bitch, man. There were times, Yeah. I was, I was motivational, but man, I was a bitch and sailor for sure too. And, and, and it's just, it's kind of, you know, part of the, the mentality, but you know, as soon as I detached from it, I, I had this deep longing for it, right? Like my God, if, if I could go back, I would have done all of these things differently. I would have really reshaped my whole perspective and been more dedicated and, and been, um, you know, just, uh, more willing to, uh, participate in a much more positive way and not got caught up in the, the negative aspects. So Mike, I, I want to ask you a question. What would you tell young men? Because obviously this is going to come out. It's going to give you more notoriety. There's going to be young people that read this. Uh, what are you going to, what do you have to say to some young man right now? That's that really his dream has been to become a seal. Um, but you know, uh, after he reads your book, what, what do you want him to feel? I'm, if that's his dream, then he should go for it. Stop, you know, I was going to say stop dreaming and just do it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like, no, there's, there, I, I don't, I don't think there's any, like for me, at least, I'm so proud that I was a Navy, like, I'm proud that I was a Navy SEAL. I still have like that pride in me, you know, I mean, I, you go to my garage, I have my plaques, my, you know, the Trident flag, like that's my little homage to me, you know, my, my 20 past career, but it's like, I, I work out in that garage and I look at that stuff. I have a flag with all the names of all the seals who have passed, you know, since nine 11, that, that still drives me to be a bit, you know, be a better person and be and like, you're still a seal. Like, it's almost like you're not doing the job, but that I, I still have the try to ingrate, you know, ingrained in me and I'm carrying, that's a weight you have to carry when you get out. Like, Yes, people still look at you as a Navy SEAL. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do after you get out. You can look at um, who's that? Johnny Kim became the astronaut, the doctor, all that. Read any article about him. It starts off with Navy SEAL Johnny Kim, then astronaut, then doctor. I mean, that's just the way it is. Like, you are always going to be represent a representation of the community. Um, but I would tell you know these young men that are going in that you know if they the first step is obviously make get get through buds um and i i was asked the other day you know what, what would you tell people to get ready for buds um 
it's like become obsessed. It's, I mean, I, I, when I made that decision to become a seal, it was like a, a switch went on and it was just an obsession. Like I, and that obsession lasted 20 years. <laughs> it's, you know, that, I'd say it was an obsession. Holy cow. Nine combat deployments. I mean that most guys will do three or four and then look for training, you know, for extended periods. But it seems that you just wanted to keep going back to war. Yeah. Um, I did. And that, and you know what, there's, there's a little bit of darkness in that as well. Um, you know, with, the wanting to continue to deploy to war. Um, I've had to go, I've had to really break down and like, you know, my Andrea always told me, she was like, you're just trying to keep going until somebody killed, like you just want to die going to war. And yeah, that was the, like, I didn't want to admit that, but that was the honest truth. I was like, I just want to keep going until my body can no longer function and I can't do this anymore or else, or I'm no longer breathing. Um, that is the, dedication and obsession that i had like and it was and it's almost when you're in you i was thank god i was in with guys i was raised by guys who had that mentality so you're it's like the, you're you're part of a wolf pack and you're like if you're going i'm going you know I'm, if you're not taking a break i'm not taking a break so let's just keep doing this it uh, feeds off each other yeah how, how and the one question that i always struggled with and i wish i, I wish i would have figured it out uh, soon and, and you know maybe we could wrap up with this concept is is you know how can guys you know not only have the wolf peck mentality and that drive and that focus to be the best operator they can be but how can they mix to be you know the ultimate and devout in their faith or or if it's not you know their definitive christianity Maybe it's a, a different type of spirituality that keeps them grounded in, in, in the difference between right and wrong, that difference between doing the right thing and, and, and also being an elite warrior. How, how do people bridge that? What would be your advice for that? Uh, my advice and what I have seen from individuals is you stick, you stick to whatever your belief system is, whatever values that you have, that you came into the SEAL community with, that brought you up to the end that made you the individual that you are that wanted you to be a seal you keep those values keep those beliefs no matter because yeah you will be thrown into the wolf pack you'll be thrown to different platoons who carry their own values their own beliefs don't let those override your beliefs at all you stick to yours and you know what you may catch some shit for it it'll wear off it'll go away once they see you actually operating and being a part of the team and like oh all right this guy is good to go he's one of us um the, the community is not going to you know shun you for your beliefs if that doesn't happen um you know you just but you have to have some thick skin you're gonna get your balls buckled just know that. <laughs> you're, you're gonna get that regardless of your faith and everything man i used to i remember i'd walk into my platoon hut and it would be like 50 cows train on rut and it was just like gah, 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 gah. and i would fend each one of them off in my my deeter 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 i'd fend them all off and and then i'd start dishing them back man that's that camaraderie right yeah for sure i mean awesome that, that's well, what makes things great well eddie you know I, I, what and i you know I, I'm, I'm always the guy like i hate that question but it, you know, you, you know, you, your, your book is, is still under review for DOD through DOD right now. And you're kind of waiting on that process. Um, I know you really settled into, you know, this life with your family and you're fixated on, on that, which you should be, I mean, all in for your family now and, and your, your children. And please tell them I said, hello, by the way. And oh, actually, uh, Andrea says to tell you hello. Ah, oh, get tell, give a big old hug. And John has said the same thing for sure, man. We, we can't wait to see you guys soon, man. I'm there soon. Cool. Um, what, what is, what is, what is it that gets you up every day and, and gets you in the fight? What is, what is the, the, the finding a uh, few ideas or concepts that you use to propel you through all, all of, you know, what you've been through as well as all of what you will go through. Um, first, the first and foremost thing that, you know, that gets me up every day is, is my family. Like that, that's a mission in itself is being a better husband, father, just a better human being all around that my kids can see. And then hopefully, you know, emulate as they get older, uh, and I mean, just really taking the time to focus on them, um, 
you know, you know, they grow up fast. Uh, I got a daughter in high school, you know, she's already, I mean, she'll be a senior next year and then she'll be out the door. My youngest son, he's at a pivotal age right now, uh, where it's like, you're, you have to fight against all the, like the electronics, the social media, you, you know, TV, you have to fight against all that to keep your kids and have them have the same values and beliefs that you do, because they're being told a million different other things on a daily basis. So, I mean, my thing is to make sure we, I take that time with my kids to really like bring them all the computers, all the, you know, electronics to get that out of here. Let's go outside. Let's do some stuff. Let's make some memories. Let's teach you something. Uh, I'm really, you know, trying to focus on that. And then also the uh, service aspect, I really love, um, which I've got to do this. I've had the, uh, honor of being able to go to work with, uh, um, Templar Medical, um, not too long ago, go teach some uh, TCCC classes. Um, I've also gone with a TSI, uh, Jared Hudson, really, really awesome, devout Christian team guy that teaches uh, phenomenal shooting courses. I've got to go with them, and I'll tell you what, like that, and I, when I went with TSI, I was going through a rough time. Uh, it was during that. That, like, completely brought me out of it. I was, like, teaching again. Man. It was like riding a bike and just seeing the impact it has on we were teaching law enforcement and they're just like minds are blown like oh my goodness we can do it this way and like yeah and they're like learning it's the same with the medical courses we put on i mean that i came back from that trip and i told my andrew and like that's that's is what i want to do i just want to teach and teach everything that i've you know all the experience i've had over the past 20 years because i really do like civilians right now are like begging to learn that kind of information especially with the environment that we're in. But, you know, we told those guys in the medical classes, like, yeah, learning how to shoot and defend yourself, that's all good. But like, this is also, I think a more, a more important aspect is like, what are you going to do if one of your family members gets shot or something, God forbid happens to them and you have to treat them? Like, do you have the supplies? Do you have the knowledge? Well, here it is right here. And we put them, they put them through a course. Uh, I really, really enjoy doing that. Um, and I'm hoping to, to continue that, especially here locally uh, in Florida, and then we'll see what, where it goes from there. Um, you know, the book is uh, <clears throat> that that took up a majority of my time last year, um, just writing it, and then uh, hopefully, you know, got our fingers crossed. You know, DoD will release it sometime in the near future, um, <laughs> and get the book out, and then sort of move on from there and start um, really delving into what I want to. You know. Amen. Well, Eddie, brother, I, I'm just again, like this is one of the ones that I just been so excited for. I, I just you you lift me up, you inspire me. I, again, you make me proud to be a a, a team guy. You, you make me proud to be you know your friend, but most importantly, man, you really make me proud to be a Christian and a good father and and a good husband. And it's just you, you're a, a wonderful example for so many people and. God bless you, man, and, and and Andrea and your family, and we just love you, brother. Love you so much. I love you, brother. That feeling is completely reciprocal. I woke up this morning and told Andrea, I was, I was stoked. I was like, I'm stoked to get on with Dave today. <laughs> awesome, brother. My man, God bless you. God bless you, brother. Holy cow. I'm telling you what, if 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 you are not inspired to be a better person, after listening to that interview, man, then then good God almighty, what's going on? I think you need to contact me sir, for some private coaching and we can get you spun around a little bit there because, holy cow, Eddie is such an inspiring human being. He's so humble. He is so down to earth. His story is so remarkable that you have to be inspired. He is a true American hero. And what he had to endure by a corrupt system is unconscionable. So, uh, man, please, please, let's support Eddie. Uh, go over to his website at, uh, uh, you can go to the book, which is eddiegallagherbook.com, or you can go to theeddiegallagher.com, where you can see all the different types, sign up for his uh, updates. You can follow him on social media. You can see he's got a battle rifle that he uh, uh, represents from Precision Tactical. He's got cool flags from Blackbird Industries. He's got some great uh, merchandise in a partnership with Nine Line Apparel. 
Uh, and again, you can find the Sean Ryan show, which is incredible. Five hours talking about the in detail. I know you were probably looking for a little bit of that, but I wanted to take a different approach. I wanted to t- teach you who Eddie was as a man, and I'm sure he didn't let you down. So hook them up, man. Go uh, to the Man in the Arena, pre-order that book. Go buy his uh, a rifle. You're going to need to get it now, man, because I'm telling you, uh, crazy gun control is coming. So go get an Eddie Gallagher Precision Tactical Weapon. Um, you know, uh, merchandise, it's all there. Follow him on social media. Send your, your support and your praise because this guy is just an amazing human being. We're so blessed and uh, I'm so blessed and, and honored again to know him. Every time I listen to his conviction, most importantly, his his message of faith, uh, it just inspires me. It's incredible. Uh, and before I hop off, I just, again, listen, do yourselves a favor. Trust me when I tell you there is nothing more important than making sure that you have the most important images of your life stored in one place, easy to use at any time there might be emergency. So going on over to and, and support my sponsor, uh, and, and I love the relationship. My partnership with these people are incredible. It's a great organization, mymedicalimages.com. Uh, it's essentially the Instagram for your medical images where you can uh, share, uh, view, share, and manage your lifetime of your family, yours and your family's medical images all in one spot in the palm of your hand. Um, you know, go ahead when you go over there and you sign up for a one-year free account. That's right. A one-year free account it's normally $29.95 per year. One-year free account to check it out. You'll see how much you love it and use it. Hopefully you don't because it's doctor images, but you probably... If you, if you need them, you need them, uh, and sign up, use promo code frog logic for a one year free subscription, man. Wow. What an incredible show. Uh, I feel so blessed again and honored. I want to, I want to thank, uh, God. <laughs> I want to thank Jesus Christ, man, for your clarity and, in, in, in tough times for me and for my family. I want to thank Jonna. I love you so much for your support and my children. I love you all. My parents, Jonna's family, my family, my friends, uh, all my teammates that's had have the struggle in their lives, uh, geez, man, it's just uh, a, such a, a a really amazing, incredible um, experience that I've had and what I've seen as a Navy SEAL and as a uh, working for Blackwater as a contractor for the CIA and and now what I've been able to do as a motivational speaker and World Championship performance coach, I, I just have had such a, a wonderful life that I'm so very thankful for. Uh, and I want to make sure everybody who's participated and is participating in my life, thank you so much. I love you very much. Uh, it really means the world. And to all of you who keep listening, uh, I know it's been a struggle to follow me. I'm not on social media really anymore. I'm on LinkedIn still. I'm still waiting for that that next social media platform that I believe is is really involved in, in free speech uh, to come along. Uh, but you can certainly head over to my website at teamfroglogic.com and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, we're really going to start uh, pushing things out. We've had a little uh, a delay in getting out new content on our Frog Logic Institute. Uh, uh, we're just we're reformulating a whole new business model uh, because we've had to shift focus a little bit. Um, so we're, we're about another month and we're going to get back at it here uh, and really start up in the content distribution on multiple platforms. So please just be patient. And I can't thank you enough for listening, my loyal listeners to my show. I hope you still enjoy it. I hope you're sharing these with your friends. Uh, it means the world to me. Thank you so much for your support. And lastly, I, I just want to thank uh, uh, Eddie and Andrea uh, for your courage, uh, your inspiring uh, display of humility and focus and determination and family and faith. Um, I just can't thank you enough, Eddie, and you um, You make me proud of, of where I come from and, and the organization I'm with and the SEAL teams. Uh, you are a representation at the highest level of that, uh, and I just I just love you, buddy. God bless you. Hoo-yah.